Welcome investors to the Absolute Return Podcast, your source for stock market analysis, global macro musings, and hedge fund investment strategies. Your hosts, Julian Klamachko and Michael Kesslering, aim to bring you the knowledge and analysis you need to become a more intelligent and wealthier investor. This episode is brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Welcome, ladies and gents, to episode 27 of the Absolute Return Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Klamachka. And I'm Mike Kessler. Today is Saturday, August 17th, a lovely day out there, but we got a lot to touch on this week in the markets. It was a real volatile week. On Wednesday, we had the biggest drop in the markets of the year. Dow was down 800 points, but we had a lot of volatility and the S&P finished down like 1%. So you had a lot of up and downs. Argentina actually crashed. Their main market crashed nearly 50% on Monday on some uh, political issues going on there. But what we're going to touch on this week off the top, interest rates. The U.S. 30-year bond fell below 2% for the first time ever. And other countries' yields are going negative. Why are rates falling and what's going on here? Some IPO news, office space company WeWork unveils IPO paperwork for its IPO. We're gonna t- chat about its financial position and its financial performance, in addition to what we, we view as egregious corporate governance. New deal in the M&A space. CBS announced a 30 billion merger with former subsidiary Biacom. We're gonna chat about the strategic rationale and some history behind that deal. Quick update on the trade war as the U.S. looks to de-escalate this trade war with China as it delayed some of the tariffs on Chinese goods this week. What's the strategy behind that? Lastly, quick M&A update on Air Canada Transat deal and what happened there. Want to touch touch on some interest rate news here as the U.S. 30-year bond fell below 2%, the yield on it for the first time ever and a lot of other yields throughout the world, uh, especially in Europe and Japan, they are crashing through zero, going to negative. So there's been a substantial rally in government bond prices. As you know, prices move opposite of yields. And so yields have just been plummeting as investors rush to the safety of government bonds, getting pricier and pricier, leading to lower and lower and now negative yields, U.S. yields uh, going below 2% for the first time. Now, what this did is it drove 10-year U.S. yields below that of the two-year yield. And now this is known as an inversion. The reason why this is important is that an inverted yield curve curve is probably the most recognized uh, recession indicator and everyone knows about it everyone pays attention to it so when either the the 10-year yield drops below the two-year or the 10-year yield drops below the three-month treasury yield that's a big warning sign to all investors that hey heads up a potential recession is uh, could be happening in the near term but we want to express some caution around those thoughts because markets tend to keep moving higher immediately following a yield curve inversion we have some precedents here of past yield curve inversions since 1978 the s p 500 has actually risen 13 percent on average from the first time the spread inverts on a closing basis to the beginning of a recession Some average performance of the S&P 500 following an inversion of the 10 and two year treasury yields, which just happened this past week. So S&P 500 performance in the next three months is positive 3% on average over six months, positive 5%. One year out, it's about 13.5%. Two years out, 15%. Finally, three years out, 17%. And so those are all positive figures. So we really just want to caution investors uh, regarding, you know, freaking out, selling everything here. When this inversion happened on Wednesday, the Dow tanked 800 points in its biggest drop of the year. So markets really freaking out about this. Uh, You know, it's obviously something you want to be wary of, something you got to be concerned about. And, you know, if you are concerned about a recession hitting and your stock's tanking 20, 30, 40%, then perhaps you should take a, a good look at your asset allocation and make sure that you're comfortable with. But what are your thoughts on the real you know, rally in safe haven bond prices causing yields to tank and the uh, 10 minus two year treasury yield inverting? Yeah, with, in, in, with regards to the uh, yield curve inversion is that what matters isn't the fact that it 
inverts is that that's, as you mentioned, isn't really that great of an indicator. But what, what to look for is how long it inverts for, as the duration that it inverts for does matter a lot. And in this example, as was a, a couple of months ago when it inverted before, is it just immediately bounced back again the next day right. and bounced off the bottom. And so although there still isn't much of a spread, it still is not inverted anymore. And one other thing that, that we had discussed in the past was that this actually isn't that good of an indicator elsewhere outside of the US. And right. a, good, a good example of that is in the, in the UK, is that their yield curve is inverted currently as well. But it's, it's not as strong of an indicator as in the U.S. And keep in mind that both in the U.S. and in the U.K., and as well as across globally, there's a lot of quantitative easing going on that really distorts the read-through that you can have on any signal of the yield curve, as right. that does, just distorts the actual the mechanics of a yield curve. Right, and that quantitative easing, what central banks are doing, they're actually going out into the market, buying bonds to push yields lower. And so one thing to think about is, is the yield curve such a reliable indicator as it used to be when back then you didn't have all this central bank intervention, but now you have central banks going out buying bonds, pushing those yields down. And so is this inversion being caused on the long end of the curve by all that central bank buying? Yeah, and, and, and just a stat for, for that in particular to the UK is the Bank of England actually owns 30, about 33% of all gilts, um, which is a higher proportion than both the Fed and ECB uh, in, for their respective jurisdictions. And so that's just a lot of manipulation that, that is going on within that yield curve. So it really takes away from any, any way that you can use it as an indicator right now. Yeah, and you mentioned other yield curve inversions globally. I mean, it's been completely useless as an indicator in Japan. I know in Canada, there's been a number of uh, false alarms where the yield curve did invert and we did not have a recession. That has happened a number of times. I have some additional data points here on market action around an inversion. So the biggest S&P 500 increase three years following the start of an inverted yield curve was tied to a December 9th, 1988 inversion. Now in this scenario, the S&P continued to post gains and three years later, it ended up almost 37% higher. So by no means is this like a real solid indicator, but what it's saying is, you know, look, be cautious out there. Uh, you know, don't be levered long or perhaps just be really comfortable uh, being in the market long-term, right? Because this does, as we saw this week, lead to some near-term volatility. Now, looking back at the 10 yield curve inversions back to 1956, the S&P continued to go up, but topped out within approximately three months of the inversion six times. But then the S&P 500 took 11 to 22 months to peak after the other four inversions. Getting back onto the central bank topic. Now the Fed is getting the blame for this recession warning, uh, more so on the short end of the curve. Some view it as a policy mistake in terms of them raising rates too aggressively last year, or perhaps not aggressively cutting enough uh, when they got back into an easing cycle uh, just last month. So it is a really, um, interesting thing to look at, not just the Fed, but I mean, more than 20 central banks globally are now easing interest rates and cutting rates uh, around the world. So it's really a trend that we're seeing globally is rates declining, yield curve inverting. And what's that saying is that markets are expecting a slowdown. And one, one thing that we were talking about offline with regards to the absolute level of, of interest rates over the last number of years is that over the last few decades for macro hedge funds, one of the most popular trades and most successful trades has been long duration, just a very simple long duration. So that that's also been interesting. Right, and so many macro funds are doing very well this year by being very long of bonds, as you said, being long duration, long 30-year bonds, which rally significantly 
as the yields decline. I saw uh, Austria has a hundred year bond, which is crazy in itself, but the yield has declined all the way down to near 1%. And that bond is up about 75% year to date. So the joke is that you now invest in uh, stocks for income and bonds for capital gains because you're seeing crazy moves out there. But I view it as you're kind of on a razor's edge because at this point with yields so low that any move in yields has just, it causes tremendous volatility in the bond price. And I believe in my opinion, consensus view is that U.S. yields may hit go down to zero or even negative, follow Europe and follow Japan. Uh, that seems to be the consensus view. However, if you take into the case where yields go up, I mean, 30 years ago, you got the you got the 30 year at 2% now, but 30 years ago is at 9%. So a lot can happen over 30 years. So if yields start to go out, those bond prices are going to plummet. Nonetheless, the craziest thing that I see nowadays is now 16 trillion of debt globally has negative yields. So that's not just on a real basis, but on a nominal basis, you have to pay central banks and even corporations to hold your money. So it's just madness out there. Speaking of madness, we got some big, uh, big IPO news this week when office space company WeWork, they unveiled the paperwork for its IPO, which could happen as soon as next month to make their official debut in the public markets. So WeWork released its much anticipated prospectus for its upcoming initial public offering. Some financial performance, the company reported a net loss of nearly 1 billion for the first six months of the year, which is just crazy. They're ra racking up an insane amount of negative profit or losses. The WeWork IPO could happen as soon as next month and it's expected to raise approximately three to four billion dollars. So one of the biggest IPOs of the year, certainly. It was recently valued in the private markets as, as high as 47 billion after SoftBank, the big uh, Japanese conglomerate who runs a vision fund, a massive hundred million dollar venture, hundred billion dollar venture capital fund. So SoftBank is the biggest backer of WeWork. They invested an additional $2 billion in the private market financing back in January. Now what WeWork does, they're, they're a nine year old real estate company that rents long-term real estate, commercial real estate, renovates it, divides it into the office, like small offices and subleases it to say entrepreneurs or anyone else looking to have a little office space in that sort of uh, environment. Since its founding nine years ago, it's raised almost 13.4 billion, largely from SoftBank's Vision Fund. A couple of highlights of the IPO filing, their membership base has grown by triple digits over 100% every year since 2014. It took them seven years to achieve 1 billion in run rate revenue, but then only one additional year to reach 2 billion, six months to reach 3 billion in run rate annual revenue. Got about 520 offices across 111 cities globally. And another interesting aspect of the filing, it details that the CEO and his wife, who also works for the company, which is a bit sketchy in my opinion, they have promised 1 billion uh, to donate 1 billion to charitable causes, which is uh, pretty noble of them. Has some lowlights of which I believe there are many here, many sort of, uh, you know, things that make you scratch your head or, Red flags, uh, right? Yeah, definitely red flags. Uh, the filing details hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate deals and personal loans involving WeWork and its CEO, Adam Newman, in addition to his super voting status and a big bonus tied to taking the company public. He can cash in even more. I mean, his stake is worth billions of dollars here and he's cashed out a lot, but he can make even more money on top of what he has if the company does well in its IPO. The other huge red flag that I see is that CEO Adam Newman, he actually acquired a bunch of real estate privately himself, in which he then goes and leases back to WeWork, which is obviously a huge conflict of interest. He also has a credit line of up to half a billion dollars. That's $500 million pledged by his WeWork shares. As we've seen, this can be prob problematic. Uh, one example of this, uh, where a CEO is levered to the hilt on margin lows tied to the stock was Valiant Pharmaceuticals. I know uh, Michael Pearson got blown out, out, out of a lot of stock as it tanked and he faced margin calls 
and the banks backing that loan are forced to sell the shares into a declining market. Uh, the last thing I wanted to flag is that um, a multiple of the CEO's family members also work for the company. And so, you know, uh, these there's a lot of red flags to be very, very wary about this upcoming IPO. What are your thoughts on the WeWork filing here? So first I'll just add a couple more red flags, then I'll get a bit into the fundamentals. But as well, the founders did acquire the We Company trademark, as WeWork has now re, re trademark or rebranded to We Company, and so they acquired that trademark prior to the company's rebranding, and then the company paid the founders five point nine million dollars for the trademark, which is just optically it's it's not a it's not a material amount for WeWork in terms of their valuation. Their forty their last valuation was forty seven billion. That's not a material amount. If if Adam Newman needed six million dollars, they could have very easily just structured a a, a bonus plan or something of that sort. But yeah, this that's just just greasy. And I mean, he trademarks the We Company. It's not like that was a different business. It was clearly for WeWork. Yeah. No reason. And if and if he was an individual that wasn't a part of the company and we work sued for that, that this would likely, this trademark would likely get thrown out in court as it would just be clear trademark trolling. Um, so I found that interesting um, as well. JP Morgan, the leader of the IPO or the, the elite underwriter in the IPO is the lead bank on his personal loan. So there's a bit of a conflict of interest there as well. Um, but getting into the unit economics, they, their actual unit economics are trending in the wrong direction. Uh, their costs per member are increasing at a high double digit rate while their revenue per member is actually decreasing. So they have a 10% contribution margin, but they plan to grow that to a 30% contribution margin, which in their, in their line of business, to just think of it as really like their unit level margins taking out the GNA. Mm -hmm. um, so subtracting OPEX. But this is reliant on them increasing their occupancy from 87%, where it was 83% a couple of years ago, to 100%. That's crazy. Which is just obviously impossible. Mm -hmm. um, but as well, they so what, when they're discussing the revenue per member decline, they do mention that this is due to them expanding into lower price point cities. However, that only makes sense if their costs are declining as well. But as, as well, just on that, on that topic, it's unlikely for them to continue to increase their contribution margin you know, to the point where it's up to 30% when they're moving to lower price point cities. So by definition, lower revenue and getting up to 100% occupancy is just very unlikely as well. And the other, th a couple other things I wanted to bring up was just on trading dynamics and how this IPO will be priced is the company did sign already. They signed a commitment letter um, with their banks for $6 billion in additional debt financing. Now that is contingent on them raising $3 billion in the IPO. So the price dynamics of this will likely be that they're not very sensitive to price, that they just need to make sure that they raise $3 billion. So that $47 billion valuation that they last raised at is likely, it's their, their IPO valuation will likely be substantially lower than that. Um, so that's interesting. And as well in the, throughout the S1, they talk a lot about the, you know, that their growth is kind of like a result of other tech companies growth as there's a number of popular tech companies that lease from WeWork. So think of like Slack, Lyft, Salesforce, they all use WeWork. So you could almost think of WeWork as like a second derivative of the overall tech industry growth. But the problem is, is that as some of these companies grow and become larger customers of WeWork, that increases their bargaining power with WeWork. And so the likelihood that they're actually reducing their Reven they're actually looking at a reduction in revenue per member from those large companies is, I, I think that's a very realistic scenario. So overall, looking at, at the company and just the dynamics of this IPO and all of the red flags, it really just seems like something to avoid. Yeah, and it makes you think, the company's been around for nine years and they, um, you know, they take out these long-term leases and 
and then uh, rent them out on a short-term basis. They've never actually been through a recession. You talk about current occupancy. Well, how are things going to happen? How is that occupancy going to look when uh, the economy goes into a, a decline, a recession, and people don't have the money to spend on office space? Instead, they go to their basement or they go to a coffee shop instead of renting that WeWork. That's, that's something to consider is they're booking massive losses, like a billion-dollar loss in a very good economy with relatively high occupancy rates. How are things going to turn when the economy is not doing so well? So you got to think about the potential sustainability of this business. The other thing is, in my opinion, no competitive advantage. We're seeing so many copycats uh, come to the market with the exact same offering, you know, short-term office space. There's plenty in Calgary. Oh, certainly. And in, in any other big city you go to, there, there's so many of these. And the other thing you touched on, the valuation is just insane like 46 47 bill, billion although you did mention the ipo is going to be lower but at the end of the day this is a real estate company masquerading as a technology company but you look at the economics and there's like nothing technological about it they're just booking massive losses sure they are growing pretty significantly but anyone can grow selling a dollar for 50 cents um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is just the egregious corporate governance here. It's definitely something to be cautious on, and we would definitely warn investors against uh, p participating in this IPO. Like I say, more red flags than a Chinese communist parade. So, like I say, be cautious on WeWork's IPO, but it'll be an interesting one to watch. Big news in the M&A space with media company CBS and Viacom. They were once part of the same company. They again agreed to merge in a $30 billion deal. Under the deal's terms, Viacom shareholders are going to receive 0.6 shares of CBS, so an all-share deal, no cash involved. CBS has a market cap of $18 billion. Viacom has a market cap of $12 billion. So combined, there'll be a $30 billion media behemoth. I mean, they'll have the largest market share in U.S. television, 22%, and a combined revenue of 28 billion dollars. Some background on the companies. CBS owns the CBS television network, obviously, CBS News, a bunch of TV stations uh, throughout major markets in the U.S. As well, they also own Showtime and the publisher Simon & Schuster. Now, Viacom, they own a bunch of different properties, uh, basically BET, it's one of the big ones, Comedy Central and MTV, along with the movie studio Paramount. Interesting history between these two companies. Now, Viacom and CBS first merged in 1999 during the dot-com bubble, and that deal was valued at $35.6 billion at the time. Now, 20 years later, they're merging at $30 billion. So there's been actually $6 billion in value destroyed over those 20 years. And after that deal, the company split in 2005. Now, 14 years later, they are rejoining again. And since 2005, Viacom shares have been flat. No performance in the stock market from Viacom shares. So they certainly have been struggling. What are your thoughts on this deal here? So I'd first would like to point out that there are some Viacom shareholders that are a little bit disgruntled because of the no premium on the, in this merger that was given to Viacom shareholders. But one of the obvious reasons for this is that the Redstone family owns 79% and 80% of CBS and Viacom respectively. Um, and the family has agreed to vote in, in favor of the deal as they're, they're controlling the, everything in this, in this company and deal. Yeah, so it's a pretty much a done deal. Absolutely. And the other thing I'd like to bring out is that the deal is actually being done at an expected a forward EBITDA multiple of seven times. And just for context, in 2017, they were trading at almost 10 times. Hmm. So this is kind of in the lower range of that historical valuation. But the other thing to keep in mind, as you had alluded to, is that their business is deteriorating substantially. Yeah. So during that same time frame, uh, they started that time frame with an $18 billion market cap. Now they're at an $11 billion market cap. So there's been a lot of value destruction in Right, Viacom. especially Viacom. They're so reliant on cable TV. And as we know, consumers are cutting the cord. 
they're going to streaming, which we've talked about a lot over this many episodes in the podcast. So Viacom has really been the poster child on the struggles of cable channels such as uh, MTV, uh, BET. They're seeing massive year-over-year declines, and they have for a number of years. And you're even seeing it with Disney and ESPN. They thought that they would always have effectively infinite growth, growing users every year, but now even ESPN is declining, which is why you're seeing Disney come out with uh, a really brilliant streaming strategy, but CBS and Viacom, you know, they they are struggling, so they are combining to try to uh, get through it together and, you know, perhaps get into the streaming game in the future. And the biggest thing is just the synergies of the deal. There's 500 million of, of expected synergies, so really just try to squeeze out some of that value. Quick update on the U.S.-China trade war. As the U.S. blinked this week in its trade war with China, as President Trump announced that it will delay the latest round of tariff increases until December 15th. These were supposed to kick in, I believe, September 1st. That leaves time for items to be shipped to the U.S. ahead of the holiday rush. Trump's uh, strategy behind this allegedly was that these tariffs wouldn't affect the Christmas holiday season. Obviously tariffs, and he's effectively admitting that China doesn't pay the tariffs as he claims, but the US consumer does. A lot of these items, they include cell phones, laptops, video game consoles, computer monitors, holiday lights, and some types of toys, shoes, and clothing. Effectively, all the things that are manufactured in China. Now, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin held discussions with Chinese Vice Premier Liu He on Tuesday morning, and another call will take place in two weeks. So these parties are in continuous discussions as they have been for, uh, you know, how long has this trade war been going on? At least a year. They continually have meetings, so there is a dialogue there. However, we're not really seeing any progress We got a quote here from Andrew Hunter of Capital Economics. He stated that the three month delay to the imposition of tariffs on more than half of the 300 billion of Chinese imports originally scheduled to take effect next month in September. It's obviously designed to avoid a politically damaging rise in consumer prices ahead of the holiday season. It should not be misinterpreted as a sign that trade tensions are easing. Nonetheless, The S&P 500 was up 1.5% on the news for the day. What are your thoughts on this latest move by Trump in the trade war? Yeah, you you mentioned that the S&P was up on the news as well. The news was positive for retailers for their, their share price. Although it's really not going to affect any of the retailers from a fundamental standpoint. Perhaps if there's any sentiment flow through, um, that could affect them. But all the retailers had taken steps to hedge or mitigate any issues with tariffs. Um, so, and, and I believe we also mentioned that just in terms of the order cycle, they were ordering and locking in prices well before this. Um, but as well, like I would just mention that this is this is just the classic Trump strategy of a large flashy announcement and then walking it back over the next couple of weeks or a couple months um, and 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 with also with regards to the comments of this being in time for Christmas season as you mentioned completely you know in a way ag- agreeing with everybody that yes it's the ultimate end customer that pays for this but really it's just political rhetoric um, he's already campaigning right despite what he always says is that China is paying the tariffs, but here with this action, effectively admitting that the U.S. consumer ultimately pays the cost in in terms of increased goods uh, of these tariffs. But nonetheless, we really want to caution investors on trading or trading investing based on any trade war headlines. You never know what's going to happen next. One day, uh, Trump comes out with a crazy tweet. The next day, he walks it back. So it's completely unpredictable, and market goes up and down on it. But ultimately, the best thing you can do as an investor is largely ignore it. Um, I mean, take it into account, but don't base any major asset allocation decisions on it and maintain a long-term view. This week was pretty much Christmas Day for merger ARBs as Air Canada raised its friendly offer for Transat by a stunning 38%. They added 200 million on top of 520 million to 
improve its friendly deal for Transat to $720 million. So market leader Air Canada, market leader in Canada, they're gonna buy the number three player Transat. They had previously struck a deal a friendly deal at 13 bucks a share, but many investors weren't too happy with that price, despite it being north of 100% premium. Prior to the deal, Transat was trading in the $6 and change range. So now this improvement from 13 to 18 makes the premium well above 200% which in terms of historical M&A in Canada over the past 10 years, it's definitely top 10, one of the largest, and that's out of hundreds and hundreds of deals. So a real Christmas present for Merger Arbs. Gotta be happy with that if they got uh, a big position in it. Now with this 30% bump in the purchase price, they get the backing of Transat's largest shareholder who controls 19% of the shares. Now this shareholder indicated that they would vote against the previous deal at 13 bucks a share. You did hear grumblings in the market that some shareholders were looking for 15, 16 bucks a share, but to see them bump to 18 is really just a jaw dropper. So market action, Transat is actually trading at $16.63, which happens to be a 7.6% discount to the $18 price, representing a nice double digit annualized return, 17% IRR under our calculations. The reason being is that this is still a conditional deal. Investors are really concerned on the regulatory aspect. It, it requires approval of Transport Canada, but the big one, being the antitrust approval, the competition bureau. And this is a real tough one um, because you have a combination of the number one and the number three player. So that is major market power, major consolidation there. And they're gonna control north of 60% on some uh, airline routes, which is a huge concern from an antitrust perspective. So it's a really tough one to call from that perspective, which is why you're seeing trans that trade at, you know, pretty significant spread to the deal price here. But nonetheless, what are your thoughts on this deal? First, you had mentioned the, uh, the, so, the, that there were some other funds that were making some grumblings about valuation. One of those funds was Pender Fund, which they owned 4% of Transat. And they said that they had valued Transat at $15 a share. And so although they haven't announced that they are in a lockup agreement to vote for the deal, I would imagine that this valuation more than appeases them. So I would think that they would be uh, on board with that as well. You'd mentioned the, the spread that the deal is, is trading at. And right now the market's pricing in an 11% chance of deal break. Um, so just in terms of context, when looking at the issues with Competition Canada, that's kind of what the merger arbs are, are putting in here. As well, I just wanted to mention uh, Group Mock prior to this, this announced deal. They had been offering $14 a share um, and they were looking to acquire about 19.5% of the company with the goal of voting that block against the deal. Um, I can't really see anybody tendering their shares at $14 anymore. So unless they're gonna uh, increase their consideration offered, um, it looks like that that is over. Yeah, and m and this strategy of Air Canada is known as a knockout blow. Uh, they just crushed Group Mock here. They got all their shareholders on side, and it's just a really tremendous price that honestly no one's going to vote against. 200% uh, plus premium, shareholders getting $18 per share, and a massive 38% bump on the previous agreed to $13 per share deal. So, yep, Transat shareholders, merger ARBs, got to be super happy about this one. And that's it for episode 27 of the Absolute Return Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, you can check out other episodes on absolutereturnpodcast.com or any other listening uh, app out there, whether it be Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube. You can check us out on all of the platforms. But until next week, uh, have a good trading week and we will chat with you soon. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in to the Absolute Return Podcast. This episode was brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com.
The views expressed in this podcast are the personal views of the participants and do not reflect the views of Accelerate. No aspect of this podcast constitutes investment, legal, or tax advice. Opinions expressed in this podcast should not be viewed as a recommendation or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or investment strategies. The information and opinions in this podcast are based on current market conditions and may fluctuate and change in the future. No representation or warranty expressed or implied is made on behalf of Accelerate. As to the accuracy or completeness of the information contained in this podcast, Accelerate does not accept any liability for any direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage suffered by any person as a result of relying on all or any part of this podcast, and any liability is expressly disclaimed.